right, Nick, welcome. How are you, man? Doing great, Jeff. Thanks for having me here. I love the uh, I love the TJ Watt in the background. Yes, it's a little intimidating for smaller people like us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's inspiring to me every time I do a great customer call. I do that the leg kick that he does. So there you go. Yeah. Well, hey, for folks that don't uh, know you or follow you on Twitter, maybe just give a little bit of your background and how you came to uh, to end up running one of the great technology companies of our time. Oh my God! Wow, that's, that's I'll take that I'll take that compliment. Thank you. No, I've been. I, I, I'm nice to meet everyone. CEO of Gainsight, uh, Nick Meta. I've been in uh, tech since 1998, which is probably relevant because we'll talk a little bit about the different ups and downs and things like that. So I started a company out of college way back in the dot com era. It was sort of a boom and bust story. And then I've been in enterprise software, you know, basically about 20 years. Uh, run, you know, run a couple companies now. We launched Gainsight about 10 years ago. Um, so it's been a while. And for folks that don't know. Um, help we help businesses build a more durable approach to growth by growing through your customers, help retain them, help drive better product adoption, expand them, things like that. So uh, you tweeted out, I'm going to read your tweet because uh, I pulled it up here. Um, I loved it. The last few years in tech between valuations, time to exit, pace of promotions, et cetera, was an interest rate fueled mirage. The sooner we accept that, the easier it will be to embrace the new reality. Yeah. The new world can be as good as long as we don't try to compare it to the old one. So I love that tweet. I reached out to you and I said, I want to have this conversation because, you know, for those of us that have been in Silicon Valley, I moved here in 1995. So I was a founder and a CEO during the dot-com bubble and lived through yeah. that whole experience. Yeah. And then, of course, we had like the next five to six years, which were kind of boring, but a yep. good time to be building. I started my second company in 2003. Nice. Um, you know, and then I would say sort of like things took off a little bit. Then we had the great financial crisis. Then it was like, everybody was bummed out. And then they took off again. We had an epic 10 year run. We're now back into one of those modes where it feels like people need to kind of um, reassess the landscape, right? The, the market, the public market has done that very swiftly, oh. cut down the valuations of public stocks. I think the average Tech IPO from 2021 is down 55%. Yep. Uh, you got categories like fintech that are down 70, 80%. Um, but it hasn't totally made its way into the private markets yet. And, yep. you know, the first half of this year, we were, it was really hard to get people to buy into the idea that the market had shifted. I think now most people are kind of there, but it's all coming up again now as we are working on plans for 2023. And in every boardroom, um, you know, there's this conversation of like, well, should we be shooting for 100% growth? Should we be shooting for 50%? How high should the burn be? What's the fundraising climate going to be? I think the answer is none of us know. Right. But the one thing that I think is super important, and, I, and this is going back to your tweet, and just for, for those of us who've been around the block for a while, is to kind of do that mindset shift and get into a mode where you're playing, you know, it's like I tell people, like, if you're on the beach and it's 80 degrees out, and it starts hailing. <laughs> you, don't, you don't sit there in your bathing suit and put on more lotion. Right? You got to kind of adjust to your surroundings. So I just let, let's just let, let me hear you. What, what did you mean yeah, by that tweet so I'll, I'll and what you, prompted it? What, kind of what drove that and what was going through my mind and when I wrote that and it's and probably still going through my mind. I think there's a few different things. One of them was um, honestly being a CEO of a company and having some like incredible teammates, but many people who've never been through these down cycles yeah. before. And just having empathy for them that they haven't seen it. And so for them, all they know is the last few years of like getting promoted every three months and, you know, raises every, you know, 15% raises and you can always go to another job. And by the way, just take time off if you want to. And right. you know, it's like, everything is great. Like you're going to be awesome. And your crypto is worth a trillion dollars. And, and like all that stuff obviously has come to a screeching halt. But the first thing that went through my mind is not everyone fully realized that, right? Even under, not just entrepreneurs, but individuals. Mm -hmm. And you can see this in the fact that like consumer spending hasn't really material. It, it probably is dropping now, but for a while has not, didn't drop. Restaurants are super packed, travel super packed. And yet we all see this thing coming. And it's like out of responsibility, people be like, hey, batten down the hatches, both companies as well as individuals it's going to be stormy for a while, right? So that was one thing that went through my mind. And by the way, the, the image that went through my mind there was like Morpheus in the Matrix giving the red pill to Neo. It's like, <laughs> like do, I, do you want to go down the rabbit hole and see the reality or do you want to keep living in this kind of fictional land, right? And so that, that's sort of one big thing specifically. Then there's a second thing, which is um, that I think like if you look, so broadly interest rates 
I'm sorry, general like artificial monetary policy, well known that it it distorts reality. It causes what people call malinvestment, like money going to things that shouldn't go into. And we've all seen that. And we all seen now the blow ups like FTX and things like that. But I think even in the SaaS world, that's my home. That's, you know, you, you've done a lot there. I think in the SaaS world, um, you know, we we all have lost sight, of course, of like long-term profitability, but also um, I think many of us didn't realize that like, it doesn't just happen automatically. Like, mm-hmm. I think mean, one of the fallacies we had the last few years is, hey, SaaS is great. You just keep growing and you're going to get big and you're eventually be super profitable. And what you're seeing is that's not true for all businesses. It doesn't just happen because at the end of the day, if you don't have a high gross margin, an efficient customer acquisition cost, and a sticky business, you probably won't ever be profitable. And this is a big difference, I think, from the old era of enterprise software, where I think the traditional enterprise software model was so sticky and so high margin that you you basically just run it and it'll eventually be super profitable. And so the second thing I think was like SaaS entrepreneurs realizing, look, you actually got to work at this and think about this a lot. And you got to make sure you got a good business. There's a lot of businesses out there that grow a lot, but don't ever end up being good businesses. And you can see that based on some of the multiples of public companies. And then the third thing, which is maybe a good counterbalance, was it's not like everything is gone forever, right? So there's two the two fallacies. On one end, it's it, everything's not going to go back to what it was. But on the flip side, it's not all gone. There's some right, right. truth in between. And we saw that in the dot-com, right? I remember in the dot-com, like initially you're like, oh, it's all going to come back like real soon. And then you're like, that's not happening. But then you hear people, I remember in 2000 being like, like I started a company, it was dot-com boom and bust, similar story. And then I remember going to talk to people and be like, yeah, the internet, that was kind of a fad, right? Totally. Like people, literally the internet was a fad. I'm like, that's definitely not true. And as you said, the people that ground it out in 2002, 2003, they started great businesses that and some of them end up being worth a lot of money, you know? So we had to find the balance between like, oh, everything's going to be fine. It's going to bounce back. And it's all over. And there's some truth in between there that we all need to find. 100% agree. And I think, you know, one of the conversations we've been having a lot with founders and CEOs lately who have not been through these cycles is trying to kind of that last point. Like, guys, trust me, on the other side, it gets better. Great financial crisis, you know, was not a lot of fun in 08, 09. But if you if your business survived and you right. were in the game in 010, 11, 12, I mean, so many of our best companies in Silicon Valley were built in that era, Stripe and Square and Uber. I mean, not to mention Facebook and others. But like that era was an incredible era for, for the growth of technology. That's exactly right. And I think that's why, you know, you have to get through it and then you have to be super thoughtful about what your business looks like on the other side. And this is where I think every entrepreneur is getting a crash course in economics, right? In like, how, what, like, what does it take to build a very profitable business over time? Because at the end of the day, that is what drives value for companies. Right. Like we have this weird world where value is sort of the unicorn and the valuation, but at the end of the day, like the value is going to be the long-term cash flow of a business. And you have to be really thoughtful about how you get there. It doesn't just happen overnight. If it happened overnight, by the way, business would be super easy. Everyone would be like, "It's that's, that doesn't, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense, right?" But so. one of the challenges too, and I, I'd love your thoughts on this. One of the challenges is a lot of early stage companies don't have a finance executive, right? And so the management team, most of them didn't go to business school. They didn't right. grow up in finance, and so they don't read Wall Street analyst reports on the weekends, right? What advice do you have for folks that are running Series A or B companies? Where can they go to learn more? Where can they go for advice and mentorship? Because the points that you're talking about in gross margins and NRR and you know all those things play out in how scalable is your company and how valuable is it going to be over time? Everybody just got focused on top line for two years. Totally. And 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 that is not the you know that's not the only important metric anymore. Exactly right. So the great thing is, I think there's a ton of resources online. Obviously, eventually you'll have a CFO or someone else helping you. But um, some resources I think I find very valuable. One is there's a lot of great people on Twitter to follow. You're you're one of them. You know, another person picking a totally different uh, person, Jameen Ball at at, uh, you know, uh, know, Altimeter, who does this great analysis of publicly traded SaaS companies. So if you're in SaaS, no brainer, follow him, right? To read all of his stuff. Um, you can get, if you talk to investment banks who, who are, will gladly talk to anyone who wants totally. to talk to them, you can get the research, um, you get email you know, stuff and definitely read it. By the way, and I'll then put a plug in for Jason Lemkin. His, his Lemkin. feed is great too. Yeah, lots sorry, of, Lemkin lots is of the metrics. ultimate, ultimate, yeah. of course. And then, and then, then one, like maybe a, like a less obvious one, I, I think as you, if you're a growth stage company, I'd highly encourage you to start listening to earnings calls. That's what I do. Super nerdy, but I, there's an app actually called Borsa that lets you easily listen to earnings calls. 
And so I literally listen to them. You can listen to them on two X because they're kind of, they're relatively low fidelity, <laughs> but, dumb, but, but, you know, I listen to the earnings calls and you get to hear, first of all, what's on CEOs minds, how they communicate things. And most importantly, the questions analysts yeah. ask, that's where the gold is. It's not the, the prepared remarks have no value, but the questions the analysts ask and how they respond to them. And you think about you envision yourself one day, maybe being a public company or a bigger company. These are the questions you're going to get asked, right? And so really being thoughtful about that, to me, earnings calls are a really interesting learning source. I love that. What about just on a personal level, you know, um, as a CEO, it, it can be a lonely job. Yeah. What advice do you have for founders and CEOs? You know, 22 has been a challenging year. Totally. 23, probably not going to be much easier. Yes. <laughs> what advice do you have for people just either from a mental well-being, a leadership perspective, motivation? Where do you go for inspiration and how do you recharge yourself? And because, you know, part of it also is the rest of your organization's keying off of you. Exactly. Right? hundred percent. I think that the thing there is you have to get yourself in good emotional and mental shape so you can help your team. And it's, it's, it's not just something that's nice to do. You have to do it because if you don't do it, you're not going to be the leader your team needs, especially right now. Mm -hmm. And so what does that practically mean? I think one thing is a peer group. Um, so it's really helpful to have a peer group. I'm in, I'm in YPO, which is a CEO group, typically for a little bit later stage companies. Um, but there's lots of great peer groups out there. Um, and you could be YPO, could be something else. And what, if there isn't one, form one, right? right? Get a few entrepreneurs together or set up a, and try to make it regular. One of the great things about some of these peer groups is you make it regular and you try to be really vulnerable, like open, like, hey, like things aren't all great. There's a lot of challenges, right? Like you can see it right now. Everyone is struggling right now. And so bring your vulnerability, let your guard down, get, create a group that fosters that. So that's the first thing I would suggest. Second thing is I think, you know, with the team, with your team, you know, balance, I think the two things you have to balance, I'm trying to balance, are the long-term optimism. Because I really believe in what we do. And I'm sure most yep. CEOs watching believe in what you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it. And then the short-term transparency and reality, right? So the two extremes aren't good. Like, don't say, hey, everything's amazing. We're all going to be great. Or this is all terrible. <laughs> we're screwed, right? There's something in between. And that's the art of communicating with your team, which is we're really going to get through this. We're going to be stronger on the other side. But it's going to take a lot of hard work. The net, I've told our team over and over again, Every I send an email to the company every week. It's like, it's going to be really hard the next few years. It's going to be really hard the next few years. Let that sink in. It's going to be really hard the next few years. In every aspect of your life, it's going to be really hard, right? But it's going to be awesome once we get through this. You know, mm -hmm. so the second thing is really involving the team in it and just to doing that. And then the third one I say is obviously from a taking care of yourself perspective, you know, hopefully you have those routines already. I'm a huge believer in atomic habits and all that. So I'm the, you know, exercise in the morning and sleep really well. And one thing I do very, the, the silly thing I do is like, Friday night to Sunday night, I do try to disconnect from technology. I've got three young, three kids. And so I um, literally delete all the work apps from my phone and turn off my email and like, like completely. So you can no Slack, no LinkedIn, no Twitter, just like, let's just kind of decompress. That doesn't have to be what you do, but you have to have something that you have as yeah. a routine. So those would be my three things. I think on that last one too, I remember when I was a 29, 30 year old founder running a company, I, you, you feel like you're on your heels a lot, right? Yes. Cause you don't know what's coming next. You haven't seen the movie before. And so you're reacting and, and both from an organizational and team and leadership standpoint, you're being reactive, but also in your personal life, right? That's your schedule right. kind of feels like it's out of your hands. You don't take the time to proactively carve out the, the time and the routines and most executives that I talk to who are further along in their career are very deliberate about their schedule, very exactly. deliberate about carving out time for themselves, taking vacations. Any advice you'd share on that? Because I think it's such an important thing that you learn over time. Totally. I mean, one of the biggest, I have a coach, you know, there's another thing to think about is having a coach and like, yeah, I've had worked with her for a long time. One of the biggest things you learn in coaching is things don't happen to you, especially if you're privileged enough to be a person in some kind of power, CEO, or whatever. Things don't happen to you. Every single thing that's on your schedule is something you made happen. Mm -hmm. You took that meeting, you agreed to that trip, you agreed to join this recurring meeting, you own it all. So I don't want to hear anything about, oh, I'm so busy and I don't know how to get control of my life. Like that, that's something other people can say. If you're the CEO, you can't say that. It's up to you. So you should own it. Like don't, don't speak in passive language. Things do not happen to you. You make them happen. By the way, one final thing that ties to this, it, the other thing I would recommend every single leader read, uh, and I'm sure you've read it before, but 
to me, one of the best blog posts of all time is Ben Horowitz, Nobody Cares, yeah, which is yeah. great to read. Read it if you haven't, but the TLDR is like, like when you're a leader, don't stop complaining about yourself and you're overworked or whatever. Like you have a hundred percent autonomy, go figure it out and then go take care of your team. So the blog post, nobody cares. I re- recommend it. I try to read it every few months. Well, his book, the hard thing about hard things is okay. great too. Okay. Um, I'm sure there's some other, we, others we could rattle off. I loved, have you read the upside of stress? Oh yeah. I like that book. Yeah, a I lot. love that. Book. I really enjoyed that one. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. And I think that idea of like being proactive versus reactive in a tough market, yeah, such an important point because so many people tend to get into a mode, they're reacting to their board, they're reacting to their yeah. investors or reacting yep. to their employees and taking the time. In fact, right now is a great time. You get the holidays. Yeah. Take the time. Where do we want to be in three months? Where do we want to be in six months? How do yes. I be proactive? How do I be, how do I be intentional? Because even if the world is going to hell around you or it feels like it is, your team will respond to that kind of leadership, right? You watch a great, you know, Mike Shanahan or, or yeah. Steve Kerr, like when they're, I, I remember earlier this year, the Warriors got off to a bad start and, you know, Kerr was like, we're going to switch the lineup. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Oh. He wasn't just like, yeah, we suck. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> right. Watch. I mean, listen to Steve Kerr. I mean, that's another good thing, right? I mean, the guy is like such an incredible motivator through thick and thin, right? Um, and you, and you will be too. I mean, everyone watch it. You can do it too. What, uh, what, what do you, where do you think things go next year? Like you've been through a bunch of these cycles. Yeah. So have I, I have so many people ask me, Hey, what's going to happen? I go, well, first of all, nobody knows. There's a great, um, one of Howard Marks, the, the great investor, one of his right. letters, he, he talks about the foul. I'll get the quote wrong, but it's along the lines of the fallacies and thinking, you know, yes, exactly. Right? And so but- as long as you admit that you don't know life is a lot easier, but where do you think things go over the next year or two? And how do you think things play out in the private technology market? Do you have any thoughts you'd share with folks? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this stuff is thinking about scenarios and then probabilities versus saying that there's some absolute certainty, right? Like as you as you were alluding to. And I, I think the way I think about it is um, the, the, the kind of concerning thing is that the mainstream economy and the like non-tech economy has not felt any impact, much impact so far. Right. And maybe just very recent last couple of days with some inflation data. But in general, they're like an unemployment is super low outside of tech. Yeah. Right. Like the economy is doing. Tech's great. been the only industry to do layoffs. And tech's doing really? layoffs. And so, but you think about it, like tech isn't isolated and we're all connected together. And so all the um, consumer spending that's happening, like, you know, whether it's a Home Depot or an American Airlines, like those kinds of companies are going to eventually start feeling it too. And, and what's going to happen is there's sort of a double effect because they're going to have to start cutting back and on staff, which means there's less people to go buy stuff from Home Depot and you know, sort of recurring thing. Mm-hmm. But also those companies then will cut back on technology spending. Now, some of them have been proactive. Some of those CIOs saw things coming, particularly like financial services, things like that. But in general, I think the, the cutback is not fully happened yet. And that all trickles, right? Because even if your customers aren't Home Depot or American Airlines, your customers' customers are. So eventually it'll come back to you. So I think there's a second wave coming would be my my broad you know, first thing is the technology second wave coming. How quickly that wave happens and how quickly we get through it to me depends a lot on how aggressive the Fed is on monetary policy. So to the extent that they like react to every small positive news and back off, I think we could be in for a really long uh, situation, like literally like years, like two, yeah. three years. To the extent that the Fed goes hardcore, it's going to be super painful, but it could happen over the course of a year. And so I think that's one thing to watch is in some ways, if we're seeing some small good news and we feel like things are getting better, that might be a bad sign yeah. that you could have a, do- a bigger double dip. If it feels painful for a while, then it might be like actually it won't be that long. So I, I hope for the, sh- the more painful short thing, I think it's possible we'll have the less painful long thing. So um, well, one of the challenges I think in the market too, is COVID was such a quick V shape, exactly. you know, the market cratered and then it came back very quickly. And so a lot of people's perception is, Oh, that's what it'll be like. We'll take not, this hit yeah. and not, come back. And a lot of the folks that I follow and read are predicting more of what you're talking about. Cause we have some really big macro issues, exactly. you know, deglobalization yeah, and, and right. other, the, the, the labor force is changing pretty dramatically in America. We have some big issues we got to we got to tackle, and and it could play out over a couple of years. And so the advice we've been giving to folks is, play for a moderated twenty three. Yeah, if things are better than expected. Great, you'll have plenty of cash and fuel to put on the fire and and do better. 
but don't plan like 23 is going to be a bonanza with a bunch of tailwinds. Were you, were you the one that shared the Muhammad El Aryan podcast on Twitter? Yeah, that was yeah. good. That was like, so for folks that don't know, he was the like legendary investor at PIMCO and he did an, an interview with Ezra Klein. And I thought it was so interesting because yeah, he shared all this stuff about like long-term issues, like structural, you know, the fact that the labor force participation is not growing and things like that. So when you listen to that, you're like, ah, it doesn't feel like this is some short V yeah. transitory thing. You know, that's a mistake. And, and everybody wants it to be short, right? Even the government wants it to be yeah. short, but it, there's a chance that we've got a bunch of things we got to work through. What about, let me, uh, let me ask you, let me take a completely different, go back to more on leadership and being a CEO. Yeah. Any tips or advice for folks on working with investors, working with their board, you know, having been through a few cycles, yeah. a lot of the folks that were rah, rah, rah cheerleaders when the market was going gangbusters in 21 are themselves finding themselves in a challenging situation as investors, which is then putting pressure on boards and founders. And I'm hearing from founders that they're in more challenging conversations. And I know you've worked with a lot of great investors, probably had some that were challenging as well. What advice do you have for founders on working with your board, collaborating with your board and working with investors? Anything you could share, I think it'd be helpful. Totally. Yeah. I think, I think one thing that is, you mentioned being on your heels, right? Like right now it's a really vicious cycle to be on your heels with investors. Cause very naturally, like if you're on your heels waiting for them to come to you and then they come to you and then they're, they're like, how come you weren't prepared for this? And then they're wondering what else. And it sort of creates a spiral. And then this is where you hear entrepreneurs, in my opinion, a lot of entrepreneurs complain about their boards. A lot of it is because they're not proactive enough with their right. board. And I'm not saying every investor is great or whatever, but a lot of them are actually trying to do a good job. And frankly, if the entrepreneur is one step ahead of them, that's one less thing to worry about. I'm sure you, you love your companies where the entrepreneur is ahead of you because you can go focus on the other ones, right? And so I think there's some element where you've got to be one step ahead and like thinking about what's what the kinds of questions they're going to ask or what's on their mind and the things you should be thinking about. Because at the end of the day, what they're thinking about is not different from what you should be thinking about. They're the same yeah. thing. You have the same goal, which is you're trying to create value for your shareholders and other stakeholders, right? And so like an example of this that happened to me recently was um, actually th very lucky for us was in the summer, um, you know, we like started seeing the, like we all saw the SaaS stocks coming down, right? And so I, Vista is one of our big investors, is a big private equity firm. And I had dinner with John Stalder, who's a partner there. And it's interesting because like coming into that meeting, I'd been thinking we got to get more efficient from a growth perspective and go rule of 40, all that type of stuff. And John was like, hey, Nick, I want to talk to you about like, you know, maybe we should get more efficient. I was like, we already have a plan. We're going to, here it is. And so it was great. And by the way, that caused us to slow down hiring and all that, which is great because, you know, obviously we are where we are now. Yeah. And so I think that kind of a thing where you can kind of be a step ahead is one, one big piece of advice. Second one is, you want to communicate more now, not less. I think the the worry a lot of investors have is the 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 companies are not hearing from except once a quarter. And, and one of the worst things, by the way, is getting that email at the end of the quarter that like, oh yeah, by the way, everything was terrible versus yeah, like <laughs> drip it along the way, right? Like, yeah, things are bad. So be open about that. I send my, so I send an email to the company every week and I actually forward that email to our investors every week. And it's just like a, like what's happening in Gainsight, but kind of giving them more awareness of what's happening. And then the third thing I would say is, um, you know, just like your team, your investors want you to like lead. And so have that vision for what you are going to do over the next year. Not, not everything's in your control. So for example, right now in SaaS, sales and revenue are largely not in most companies control, right? Like mm -hmm. the economy is what it is, but your costs are in your control, right? How you use your resources efficiently are in control, like have that plan together, you know? So I think those are some some piece of advice because I think investors want entrepreneurs to lead. They don't want them to be followers, you know? Yeah, and, and, and uh, you know, back to your point about being proactive, most of the time, my advice to CEOs is, most of the time you actually know what you need to do. Exactly. Right? You, you right. know better than your board and your investors. Totally. And so you're probably thinking about the two or three things you need to do Put it out there. Have that conversation. If, that. Any, if nothing else, you'll get some good critical feedback on the ideas that you have. But yeah, I mean, there's nothing worse than the the two or three months of silence. And and you know, everybody knows it's a hard market. It's a hard time. But the more frequent you have those touch points, the more easy it is for everybody to stay up to speed. On that point, by the way, Jeff, one thing that I think is very practical is at the end of your board meeting or whatever interaction you have. I think it's very useful to ask for feedback at the end. And so one thing I've done literally for like 10 years, every, every board meeting is at the end, I ask, go around the table. What are you most excited about from what you heard today? 
what would you focus on if you were me, which is basically what are the challenges, whatever, and then any feedback on my team. So I get those every single time. And I actually document that I share it with the team and everything else. And I think that's a really useful, whether those are the questions, like think of some powerful questions to ask at the end of your board meetings. I love that because it's like, hey guys, we just spent two hours together. Yeah. Let's not all walk away with our free water and, and <laughs> exactly. you know go off into the weekend. Uh, in fact, we had a handshake board meeting last week and Garrett did oh, that at the end. It, almost okay. exactly the same format. And it was really, really powerful because we have some great independent directors on that board. And yeah. the insights that they shared with him as a result of that two hour con- or three hour conversation was really, really impactful. Love that. Yeah, Garrett's great. That's awesome. What else? What are you doing for fun these days since the Steelers aren't, aren't yeah, I know, not going to win the Super Bowl? <laughs> yeah, watching the Steelers is still my path. I, I actually, crazy enough, haven't missed a game in 25 years. So I'm, I'm on this weird streak. So thick and thin. I've gone to a couple of games in person this year, which we actually love. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, try to try to uh, we've got, you know, the three kids at home, my oldest is a high school senior. So definitely we're really close. I'm not not ready for her to graduate and all that, but enjoy the last that. My oldest is a freshman. A freshman. So you're college. back. In, I'll get some coping tips from you. Yeah. And that's uh, great. You know, I loved it. I, I um just watching her go off into a new yes. era of life has been awesome. Like it's super cool to just see it was obviously very emotional and hard as a family, but like just seeing her getting to move into the next level of her life has been pretty awesome. And we're lucky she's at TCU and they happen oh. to be having a, a, a pretty good year in college football. So she's that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I totally agree with you. Watching your kids grow and seeing them is, is amazing and similar to similar to companies, right? There's a lot of parallels there. So, yeah. Well, thanks for doing this, man. I appreciate it. And I know folks will love hearing your thoughts and, um, you know, keep sharing them on Twitter because they get shared. I yeah. think that's, you know, I have people ask me, why do you spend so much time on Twitter? I'm like, you'd be amazed how much people, even if they don't respond or comment, I find that, that the, the, the comments, like I shared your tweet with probably 10 different CEOs. Interesting. And all of them were like, that resonates. Yeah. Thanks, man. Really appreciate that. I'll yeah. keep it up. Cool. Awesome. Buddy. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it. Thanks, you, man. Thanks so much. All right, man. Take care.